2,500 years ago, a man sat under a Bodhi tree, determined not to budge until he saw all there was to see. Upon arising, now enlightened, the Buddha spent the next 45 years teaching a new and revolutionary way of seeing the world. The essence of his teachings, called the Dharma, was articulated in the Four Noble Truths, where he taught the path to the end of all suffering. Central to these teachings was an important notion that the Dharma is not just about humans. Rather, it includes all of the beings who share the earth. During the course of this film, we'll explore what the Buddha taught us about animals and our relationship to them. Most people raised in the West were taught that animals are very different from people. The food culture centers around eating animals. It's everywhere, in advertising, in restaurants, in the supermarket. And few people think twice before eating a hamburger, or steak, or a piece of chicken. The entertainment industry showcases them in circuses, and zoos, and aquariums and the medical and cosmetics industries experiment on them. Most of us care very deeply about our companion animals, such as dogs and cats, but we often fail to extend this same compassion to other animals. Imagine instead a culture where animals are not harmed. When people are introduced to the Dharma, one of the first things they're taught is the first precept, cause no harm. And they're taught that this principle of non-harm extends not just to humans, but to all beings. Unlike in Western culture where animals are kind of considered a separate, almost a separate form of life and humans are considered very, very different, in Buddhism we're all considered to be just a part of nature and that we all have the same, what we could say, five aggregates. We're all made up of the same kinds of stuff. So there's not a hard and fast dividing line between humans on the one hand and the creatures on the other. That's why the first ethical precept in the Buddha's teachings is not to take the life of any living being. So I think that's the fundamental stance from the point of view of the Dharma. As a Buddhist, when you take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, the one of the principles that uh, by taking uh, refuge in Dharma and Buddha is that not harming other beings, not causing harm to other beings. That is the uh, uh, number one key principles that you take by taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. When I'm asked what's the major factor of Buddhism, I will say ahimsa, and ahimsa means non-harming. And in what I've learned of Buddhism, the non-harming is of ourselves, of others, including animals, and of the environment. Those three things are the three things that I see, at least our tradition, try to deal with all the time. To live lightly on the land, and that would certainly include not taking the life of another, uh, not stealing their life and also what their bodies were made of. So uh, the teaching is really, you know, not to do any harm. That's the first precept, not to do, not to kill, or, or sometimes it's translated as harm uh, living beings. And... Uh, it's partly to do with a, a sense of compassion for the animal, a sense of recognizing that animals suffer. There's also, uh, you might say, um, uh, a more transcendent view of it that, you know, uh, according to the Dharma, uh, we take rebirth. And it might be that um, uh, some of the animals that you are, that we are uh, killing, were once human beings or, or 
uh, hopefully we're moving up uh, the strata. So um, I think you, it's basically seeing his teaching as a whole and putting all animals within that process of, of liberation. I'm lucky in a sense I've taken the precepts in all three traditions. I'm a joint monk now in the Tibetan tradition and the Soto Zen tradition. But in my early days I trained in the Theravada tradition and spent a short time as a Theravada monk. So I've taken the precepts in all three traditions. In the early tradition of Theravada the first precept was translated to me as Panatipada Venamani Sikapadang Samadhyami. I undertake the rule of training to refrain from causing injury to living things. That's all living things, that's how it was taught to me, and that's how I teach people. All living things. So we refrain from harming them. That's the same in the Tibetan tradition, because in the Tibetan uh, tradition the Vinaya is based on the early Patimoka tradition anyway, so the, the precepts are more or less the same. The difference comes in the Zen tradition, where the first precept just says, do not kill. And this means, do not kill the Buddha. Do not kill the Buddha mind, if you like. Do not do anything that hampers the growth and movement and flow of the Buddha mind, the Buddha nature, the Dharmakaya. So obviously uh, the eating of animals and the interfering with the animal kingdom, exploiting it, does affect that precept, does block that flow, does get in the way of the flow of the Buddha mind, of the Dharmakaya. So the first precept, not to cause any injury to any living thing, means any living thing. You know, it's interesting to me because the suttas on one hand are very clear about non-harming. And when they talk about beings, it's all beings, it's sentient beings. Um, included in the first precept of non-harming is to not take life. So that seems fairly clear to me that the Buddha was intending us to include in our field of metta or loving kindness all kinds of beings from the smallest to the largest, the two-legged, the four-legged, the many-legged. So that's really how I hold it and certainly how I try to live my life and I don't claim to be perfect. There are challenging situations about that but the first precept of non-harming is, is really very dear to my heart both as an attitude towards you know people that people that I meet certainly but as I said to all beings and really knowing, acknowledging that to each being, their life is precious. To practice compassion, to practice uh, loving friendliness, metta, uh, to appreciate, to develop, uh, appreciate the joy of life. We always say uh, we have came from killing, one of the five precepts. <clears throat> so uh, this precept applies to everybody. Buddhism has two main branches, Mahayana and Theravada. In both lineages, the Buddha talks about our relationship to animals and the fundamental question of the morality of eating them. In the Mahayana scriptures, the Buddha is unequivocal, addressing the subject in detail in the Lankavatara Sutra. For innumerable reasons, the Bodhisattva, whose nature is compassion, is not to eat any meat. Thus, Mahamati, whenever there is the evolution of living beings, let people cherish the thought of kinship with them, and thinking that all beings are to be loved as if they were an only child, let them refrain from eating meat. If, Mahamati, meat is not eaten by anybody for any reason, there will be no destroyer of life. Thus, Mahamati, meat-eating I have not permitted to anyone. I do not permit, I will not permit. There are many different quotes of the Paris Buddha talking about different lives and not eating meat. One of the very strong statements that Buddha had oh. is, I condemned meat eating in all means. I have never a approved a meat eating. I will never approve a meat eating. And I do not approve a meat eating for my followers. For all sentient beings are equal to me, 
like my only son. For bodhisattva vows, uh, lay people can also take bodhisattva vows if they choose. Monastics have our monastic precepts that are different from lay people, or at least more elaborated than what the lay people take as the five precepts. But the bodhisattva vows, um, they can also take vows, and the bodhisattva precepts um, will, will prohibit eat, meat eating, whether you're a lay person or a monastic. Um, it's very explicit. So, Buddha's main teaching is uh, be vegetarian. Mm. Mm. Main teaching is uh, don't kill uh, animal, don't kill human, human body, don't kill animals, uh, mm, don't uh, mm, lying, don't stealing, very nice, honest, compassion yeah, for other to take care for how is I can do other to benefit only these things remember he always he said the Buddha also addresses the subject of eating animal products in the Surangama Sutra bhikshus who do not wear silk leather boots furs or down from this country or consume milk cream or butter can truly transcend this world. In the Theravadan scriptures, only a few passages address the subject of eating meat. In the Jivaka Sutta, the Buddha discusses a notion called the Three Purities, saying that monks are not allowed to eat meat unless they know the animal was not killed for them. Jivaka I say that there are three instances in which meat should not be eaten, when it is seen, heard, or suspected that the living being has been slaughtered for oneself. I say that meat should not be eaten in these three instances. I say that there are three instances in which meat may be eaten, when it is not seen, not heard, and not suspected that the living being has been slaughtered for oneself. So one of the monastic rules in uh, Theravadan Buddhism is that monks are allowed to eat meat. And I think that was a very practical thing at the time of the Buddha, as I understand it, because of the simple concept, beggars can't be choosers. And we have these penniless, wandering vagabonds who need to sustain their bodies in order to carry on their Dharma practice. If they went from house to house and said, no, I have to have a special kind of food, no, don't give me that, it would have been much harder for the lay community to support them. So the Buddha said it was permissible for them to eat meat as long as they didn't know, uh, hear, or suspect that the animal had been killed specifically for them. If they suspected that or knew that, then they weren't allowed to eat that meat. So I think what the Buddha was saying is that as agents, we shouldn't, where we have a choice, we shouldn't be involved in that chain of killing. Even though the, the bhikkhu had not done the killing and someone else had done that, it was still considered improper if it was killed with the bhikkhu in mind. In a modern consumer society, when we walk into the supermarket, one has to wonder, who have those animals been killed for? And as an average consumer, you know, it often feels to me like they, they were killed with me in mind if I, if I buy that meat. So an updated understanding of that could be in this modern consumer society. By buying meat and fish products, we're participating in that same chain of killing that the Buddha recommended against. And so the rule was made that if you uh, didn't ask, if you didn't kill the animal yourself, you didn't request it to be killed for you, and you are not aware that it was killed on your behalf, then karmically you are pure, because you were just wandering around through the villages collecting whatever people happen to want to put in your begging bowl. But in a situation where actually you are in charge of what you can eat and you go into butcher shops and you buy meat, then in a way the very fact that you're buying it is saying that you are 
subscribing to the whole culture which rears meat to be killed for consumption. I mean, they only kill, raise and kill these animals because people buy the meat. If we didn't buy it, they would, that particular industry would die out. That if somebody goes into a market, say on a Tuesday, and orders a piece of chicken, at the sales counter, somebody will click some kind of a calculator, which will determine on Tuesday, a piece of chicken was sold, which will send out a message for next Tuesday that we have to meet the same quantity of chickens to satisfy our customer base. You know, so even though it, when you order the chicken on Tuesday, you're not responsible for the death of the chicken that's providing that meal on Tuesday, <laughs> but in an indirect way, you can be s sending a signal that next Tuesday a chicken should be killed to provide food for the customers. Many people who have not spent time with animals don't realize just how much like us they are. They're smart, sensitive, emotional, and it doesn't take long to realize that every animal has his own unique personality. However, despite their being sensitive, we often treat animals with extreme insensitivity, even cruelty. Buddhists realize that all lives are equal in terms of wanting peace and happiness, not wanting um, pain and suffering. We are all same sentient being. Just we have a different form of life, but in terms of living the life is same, human or the animal and same desire, same uh, right to live in peace and happiness. The Dharma relationship to uh, uh, animals, first and foremost, is the recognition that animals have consciousness, which means that they feel. Animals is like ourselves. They also uh, appreciate the kindness uh, they also uh, fear of death and avoid sufferings and uh, also desire for happiness. Uh, I think uh, we are human beings, we understand uh, what is suffering and what is happiness and also we uh, advance enough to understand that the other animals also have that feeling as well. You only have to live in a place like this where we see deer out the window and the mother deer with her little babies in the spring and how tenderly she takes care of them and how much they look to their mother for safety and protection and follow her and feel safe with her and, and to know that there's a bond there that's really precious for them. And in seeing that, it opens our hearts to that sense of connectedness. So I think just to for people to broaden their understanding of animals and the animal experience is an important part of this consideration of choices in what we eat. These animals are sentient beings that live, have their lives. And so I, I want to be able to treat the animal world with great respect, with great kindness, and that they have just as much right to be here as any other being. For most of us, besides our companion animals, our main relationship to animals is the food we eat. Yet because the process of food production is hidden from sight, it's easy to avoid the connection between the food on our plates and the animal she once was. Are these animals being killed for you? And normally people have no idea what animals go through. Um, 
it will it will only be realized when you get to see uh, what actually happens in the slaughterhouses. Um, until then, you wouldn't realize. And, and when you see that, actually, um, you will feel um, if that is really appropriate to eat them. Um, it's really horrifying. Um, um, a certain slaughterhouses have like um, the entire animal that they are supposed to slaughter the, for the day are uh, standing in a corner out there and then the, the one by another being slaughtered in front of the rest of the animal and then you can um, imagine how um, terrifying uh, that experience would be. Uh, it just imagine yourself being uh, out there and all your friends and colleagues are being slaughtered uh, and you are in, in, in the line, just, you know, a step away from that um, terrifying thing. According to the most religion, talk about hell, like most horrifying suffering realm, but I can't imagine there is something more horrifying and painful uh, so-called hell than those horrifying experience when you are lined up uh, in the slaughterhouse. Uh, just heartbreaking. So we need to actually uh, see those things so, so that how we humans uh, are actually causing so much trouble to other fellow um, sentient beings. It's said that throughout the average lifespan of an American um, who lives to be maybe 75, he or she will be responsible for the deaths of 15,000 animals, you know, from large to small, on an average American diet. So that's a lot of killing, that's a lot of karma to be responsible for. Um, there's not so much separation. There's an apparent separation between us and other creatures, but actually when we become very sensitive, we can feel that when we see another being in suffering, that we feel the suffering too. So usually this is a very human response. You cannot bear to see an animal killed in front of you or, or being, you know, dying in front of you. Well, you know, I mean, just as I wouldn't particularly like someone to uh, kill and eat me, I don't think any being wants to be slaughtered and killed and eaten. And especially considering the manner in which animals are killed in this day and age, the terror and the trauma that they go through in, in, the, in the process. How can we sit down and eat them? The Buddha really um, expressed his teaching or reduced his teaching in a very simple formula. He said uh, in the Pali, Dukkha, Dukkha, Niroda, it's three words. Uh, he said that uh, he basically taught suffering, which means how it arises and all that, and the end of it, how, how we bring it to an end. Now, uh, anybody in contact with suffering is moved by it. it there's a, um, when we see somebody suffering or an animal suffering, uh, there's a resonance in our own hearts uh, which connects us with that suffering. Uh, we can call it a sorrow. And that sorrow drives us to try and do something about uh, that person or that animal. I don't think that by my eating vegetarian or my becoming a vegetarian, uh, being vegeta vegetarian or my uh, other people becoming vegetarian, uh, the world will stop uh, killing. Uh, no matter how many people become vegetarians, the world will not stop killing. But we can minimize the amount of animals raised in farms for killing. So the, the number of animals slaughtered can come down if people become vegetarians.
a lot of people pay attention to the precept about not taking a life, and that makes sense. That's kind of obvious. Almost every world religion has something about not killing, and there is no asterisk. It doesn't say humans. It says thou shalt not kill. Same with the Buddhist precepts. It doesn't say just humans. It says we shall not take breath away. We should not take a life. But the precept that gets very little attention that I think is very important and related to that is the precept of not taking that which is not freely offered. Because when we take cow's milk, that milk was created by the mother cow for her offspring. And when we take that milk away, we are taking that which is not freely offered. And when I say not freely offered, it's not freely offered for a number of reasons. There's a price the cow pays. The baby is taken away from the mother soon after birth, within days, so that we can take the milk. And I find that heartbreaking. And I've heard cows crying for one another. The mother cow is just belting and screaming for the baby, and the baby is crying for the mother, and it's heart-wrenching. We do that routinely so that humans can take the milk. To me, that is stealing. Also, we take the life of the cow in that after her production falls and she's not as productive as she was, that's another way we're taking her life and we're taking that which is not freely given. It's not freely given because she gives her life for the milk industry. Even on the most humane farms, even where the cow is treated beautifully during life, she is repeatedly impregnated, repeatedly impregnated. It's a nine-month gestation just like humans. She gives birth and then the baby's taken away. And she has to be repeatedly impregnated so that she will keep milk flowing at the production levels that we've bred them to produce, and it's unnatural. So they're frequently uncomfortable. The udders are frequently distended and get mastitis and other problems. And we're stealing the milk from the baby whose milk it should be. If you look at the life of a chicken, a chicken raised for her eggs, they're all born in, um, in incubators. They don't have the benefit of their, their mother nurturing them. And then, of course, Half of your little chicks are going to be males. And those male chickens that are raised for their eggs um, are not going to be good flesh producers. They're small animals that put all their, their nutrients into producing a large number of eggs. So the little male chicks are just ground up alive when they're less than a day old. And the females that are kept, then they have the tips of their beaks seared off, they're de-beaked. And then they go live in a cage. And that's where they stay for a year and a half, two years. And after that, their egg production decreases, and so they're gassed or they're sent to slaughter. So whether it's a free-range farm, a cage-free farm, or a battery farm, chickens have a horrendous life. When everybody gets before King Yama after they've died, and they start blaming each other. If you didn't want to eat it, I wouldn't kill it. And if you didn't kill it, I wouldn't sell it. And so we have the buyer, the seller, and the, the slaughterer all putting the blame on somebody else, when in fact, Truly, it is interconnected. If you didn't have one, you wouldn't need the other. I see that argument as modern, but I also see it as ancient. If you care about suffering, if you care about your own suffering and the suffering of others, uh, then you want to know what that person, that other being's experience is. And you don't want to turn away, right? You want to know. You want to know what, how am I acting? What am I doing that's, that I may not have been aware of that's creating difficulty and suffering? I think that would be true for anyone who cared about suffering. And you don't have to look very far or hard to see the suffering that comes, obviously, from uh, killing animals. Uh, you know, in the Dharma, Part of what we're encouraged and invited to do is to turn towards suffering and not avert ourselves or turn away. You know, we want to see what's, what's the cause of my suffering and what leads to the end of suffering. Of all the things we can do to help alleviate the suffering of animals, the most important is to stop eating them. You might also consider no longer consuming their products, such as milk and eggs. When you do, you may be surprised at just how good vegan food tastes. For those who find it difficult to stop all at once, a gradual transition may be easier. Maybe start by choosing one meal a day, or one day a week to be vegetarian or vegan. Try substituting soy milk for cow's milk in your breakfast cereal. It just takes one second to decide stopping. Now, it doesn't make any huge chaotic change in our life. It's just we eat something else. It's so simple. 
can be done instantly. So, less effort for the very big result, ethically, for the animals and other, other poor people, for the planet, for our own health. It seems that a sensible mind should say this is not an extremist perspective, this is a most reasonable and compassionate point of view. It's also about the, the environment that we need to protect. The environment not just about uh, water uh, and atmosphere, greenhouse, but it's also about forest, it's also about other form of life that we need to protect because it's the important ecosystem. So I think vegetarians is a very holistic approach uh, that fast to embrace uh, all, all that uh, uh, awareness and also uh, the kindness and compassion practice um, uh, are very much uh, together uh, in a very holistic way. The, the point with vegetarianism is that in this modern day and age where food is, is so easily obtained, there doesn't seem to me to be too much excuse to eat any kind of food which has caused pain to another being. I mean, it doesn't seem to fit in with our whole idea on uh, compassion and bodhicitta. Previous to uh, my monastic ordination, I was married and I had a child. I was once out with my son in his stroller. A lady came by and was admiring him and uh, went for that typical pinch the chicks little uh, movement and said something to the effect, you're so cute I could eat you. And at that moment, it hit me like the proverbial ton of bricks that all the animals that are ever eaten are somebody's child. And I certainly didn't want my child eaten, even figuratively. So that was my transition from being a health conscious vegetarian to an ethical vegetarian. How can we bring this compassion to all beings? Yes, we may not be able to do it all the time. We may inadvertently be causing harm, but how again, as I came back earlier, to cause the least harm possible and to become educated, to become aware of what actually is here. In early uh, days of my life, I was not a vegetarian. I, had, uh, I ate all kind of uh, meat. But later on, uh, purely because of my conscience, I thought uh, it would be much better if I become a vegetarian. I have seen animals being slaughtered. I have seen animals raised for meat in farms and so on. I have seen animals suffering. And uh, therefore I felt uh, a little guilty of eating meat. Uh, I have to, when people uh, ask me to talk on Dhamma, I talk on Metta, Living Friendliness Meditation, also I teach. And when people uh, ask questions about uh, meat eating, uh, eating meat, this appears to me not compatible. Yes, I was a monk in South Korea back in the 80s and uh, it was in a monastery. Uh, when I got there I realized that they were vegan, what we would call vegan. No meat, dairy or eggs, no wool, silk or leather and it really deepened my commitment to being a vegan. The practice of plant-based eating had been going on for centuries, maybe for 700 years and it was part of the practice of deepening meditation, the idea that it's difficult to go deep in meditation if I'm acting in ways that are not ethical and harming other living beings uh, disconnects me from the root of compassion and meditative equanimity. We're all raised in a society where we're forced to disconnect from our natural wisdom and compassion. If you say, I'm no eat meat, 
one year I know eat meat, that's also good benefit. If say I'm one month no eating, that's also good. I'm not eating one day, also benefit. benefit. Then eat. Uh, completely whole life no eat, that's the best. When you do go vegan, not only will the animals thank you, so will your body. It's often easy to find products that are not tested on animals and do not contain animal ingredients. Look for the words, not tested on animals, or no animal ingredients, or look for the cruelty-free logo. An excellent book on animals and the Dharma is The Great Compassion by Norm Phelps. If you would like more information, the Dharma Voices for Animals website has a resource page with many helpful recommendations. If you've ever been on a Buddhist retreat, you were probably reminded to refrain from harming insects, such as spiders and mosquitoes, as part of the first precepts principle of non-harm. Try extending this practice into your everyday life. If animals come into your home, consider trapping and releasing them. Another thing you can do is talk to people about our relationship to animals, engaging them one-on-one -on -one or starting a discussion within your Sangha. You can also arrange for a screening of this video. Talking with others about this issue is an opportunity to practice right speech. It's important to always be respectful and make it clear that you are not telling people what to do or judging them. Instead, you are simply asking them to consider this important issue. When people reach this point in their practice where they're investigating the question of vegetarianism or veganism, they really have to examine it from a lot of different alternatives. What foods are they familiar with? What foods are they comfortable with? What foods do they have access to on a daily basis that will really strengthen their body and support their health? It may take some time as they wrestle with the ethical question, as they experiment with their diet, to figure out what's, what's going to feel best for them in the long run. I really think it's important for every practitioner to approach that in an open-ended and pressure-free way so they come to their own understanding about it. So I don't think from uh, myself or my friends who are vegetarian that we have a judging attitude to people as they explore that. The choices we make uh, about whether to eat animals or not is such an important decision, not only for the animals who suffer so terribly, but also for ourselves, the law of karma. Buddhists worldwide should be at the forefront of, of, this, of this discussion. And yet, it seems that no one is, is talking about this. I'm very grateful, though, to a number of Buddhist teachers around the world who have been recently uh, identifying themselves as vegetarian or as vegan, and also sharing with their sanghas and with, their, um, uh, with the folks in the retreat centers that it's the Buddhist teachings on non-harming and compassion which leads the teacher uh, to deciding not to, not to eat animals. As you know, it's very interesting. I have made a choice due to this, my own sense of the sensitivity of beings to, to try to cause the least harm and to not eat them. And actually, I don't even wear them. And I don't want to use any products that are part of them in there. But I also know, you know, I wear these clothes, I use a phone, I drive a car, and it could be also part of exploitive labor. I mean, it's impossible, as I said earlier. It's impossible not to cause harm, but how can I cause the least harm and let us make a conscious choice? So my dear friends, sisters and brothers, colleagues in the Dharma world, um, I invite you to just to bring awareness and let, let your awareness in these teachings of the Dharma inform you. I've spent a lot of time trying to understand why it's so hard for people to become vegetarian. It's come down to, um, for me, two main reasons, both of which are Buddhist concepts. The first is conditioning. 
We're taught that it's okay to eat animals. We're told by our parents, we're told by society. It's constantly reinforced. And when we're conditioned our entire lives to see things one way, it's hard to see them another. And this really goes to, um, to really Buddhist training where we spend our time reconditioning ourselves. But it does start with an intent to recondition ourselves. And it's a process. And I think the second reason, and probably the biggest reason it's so hard for people to stop, is desire. And it's not a simple desire. It's a craving, it's clinging, it's attachment. We like eating meat. We like the way it feels. We just don't want to give it up. And this, of course, goes to the heart of the Buddhist teachings, the Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination. And we know that desire is the cause of suffering. In this case, the cause of your suffering and the cause of the suffering of other beings. And it's only through um, overcoming desire and giving up our attachments that we can put an end to suffering. It's what we do that defines us. It's how we act and how we behave that defines us as Buddhists, not what we say or chant about or what pictures we have. So we really have to wake up uh, to what we are and what our responsibilities are and be honest. It's very difficult to be honest and, and just look at yourselves, those who eat meat, just reflect. It's because you like it, isn't it, really? I've heard people say, I'm just not ready to give it up yet. So that's an honest answer. Um, you could ex one could explore that and there could be a lot, well, what, what's going on if you were to unpack that? You know, what, what's holding you on to that? If you've gotten to a point where you can say, I'm not ready to give it up, that is saying, well, there's something really, uh, maybe I, I would want to entertain or that I could, but I'm not quite ready to go there. Interesting place for someone who can say, I'm not ready to give it up. So you know you're causing harm or there's something about it. I would see that as to be a, a really rich and fruitful area for investigation. I think the only thing that I wish for within the Dharma community is not to push my ideas of veganism on you, but to investigate for yourself what is true. And to know that when you're eating a burger or meat, it's flesh and it's the skin of an animal. And like, let that not be denied. And so I don't want to be critical of my sisters and brothers in the Dharma, but I, I do wish for you all to look very closely at what it actually is that we're putting in our mouths. Our relationship to animals provides an excellent opportunity for developing our practice by being continually mindful of how our actions impact animals, we can cultivate compassion and non-harm and other wholesome Buddhist qualities. And it's always been my preference to, to be vegetarian since I became a Buddhist. Compassion is always defined well, very simply with the same fixed expression, which is it's the quality of the heart, or it's the quality that makes the heart of a good person tremble with the suffering of others, and it's the wish to alleviate the suffering of others. So it would, again, it would seem to me sort of intuitively that if one has this deep quality of compassion, that one doesn't want others to suffer, and one knows that either ordering meat or consuming meat is going to, through some chain of causation, bring about the even the cruel upbringing and the slaughter of animals, that out of compassion one would ad adopt vegetarianism. So that's why it seems to me that if one takes the ethical principles of Buddhism, in my own reflection, and tries to be strictly consistent with them, it would seem to entail an obligation to observe vegetarianism, at least within in countries where one does have an option. The heart of the Buddhist path is compassion. That means to value others. If you value others, you value their well-being and their, you're concerned by their suffering. And so it seems that, um, aberrant to survive at the cost of others' suffering. And so if we can do it, if, there's a, if we can survive, 
so of course that means the condition that in which we can find other types of means of survival. Mm -hmm. And then it's, for me, it seems to be a, a must uh, in terms of Buddhist practice. We are engaged in sharing with our brothers and sisters in the Dharma this understanding that compassion is the highest form of wisdom and that compassion for all is what we are called upon to have and feel and develop. Compassion again is just, uh, it's just that movement uh, away from harm to protection, to doing good. It's, it's just a natural process that happens once you refrain from doing harm. Well, to quote George Bernard Shaw, animals are my friends and I don't eat my friends. For the Buddhist community, uh, my brothers and sisters, my appeal for you is that since we took refuge in Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha and we uh, took the basic principles from among them, number one is not killing. In terms of not killing, it's not necessarily mean that you go kill, but it's also causing the killing. So, which means when you eat other animal, you are the cause of that killing. So, my appeal to you is that try to learn about a vegetarian lifestyle, try to learn about a vegan lifestyle, which is way healthier, more compassionate lifestyle. So please try that because we have taken certain principle before the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And if we don't follow our principles, then we are just name Buddhist. So try to live your belief, live your faith and try to put Dhamma into your practice. For all of us, None of us are going to be perfect. We're going to have places. We, and, but what happens is our, um, our awareness and our deepening and our ability to actualize the first precept of non-harming, it grows as a, as a fruit of all the other parts of Dharma practice that we're doing. So the basic sense of compassion is also uh, explained in the Metta Sutta uh, when the Buddha said, just as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one care for all living beings. Just like us, animals want to live lives free of pain and suffering. And it is up to each of us to make choices that respect all of the creatures of the earth. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe. May all beings be free from suffering.